So what's it been? Like six months since we've had an episode of the Wheel of Time read-through? Well, today we're back, and I'm picking up with one of my favorite chapters from Eye of the World, and a chapter that contains an iconic speech by Moraine. Now, if you have not watched the other videos in this series, the first part of this video is going to be a spoiler-free recap of the chapter. Spoiler-free as in, we're not going to spoil anything past Eye of the World Chapter 9. But we will be recapping the chapter, and I'm going to have visuals on the screen to help you understand what you just read. The second section of the video will be completely spoiler-filled. I'll be breaking down all of the foreshadowing, Easter eggs, and details from the chapter. I'll throw up a new spoiler warning when we get to that point. Make sure to check out all of the previous videos in the series, depending on when you're watching this or the videos after. Join me today as I break down Chapter 9 of Eye of the World, titled Tellings of the Wheel. Now, the last thing before diving into the recap, thank you to the video sponsor, Audible.com. Audible is the world's largest provider of audiobooks and a longtime sponsor of the channel. They are giving all of my viewers a free audiobook, so make sure to head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus and grab your free book. You greatly support the channel, and you get a free book from doing it. It's a win-win. All right, let's get to it. Now, the chapter kicks off with Rand dreaming. He's being chased by Trollocs, and worse, through a nightmare landscape of lifeless hills and jagged volcanic mountains. Now, Rand has the vague feeling of recognition for one of the specific mountains, which is a really bleak stone spire. It's a dagger stabbing up into the sky is his way of describing it, and he feels like it's a source of desolation. Now, a familiar voice whispers to him, ordering him to serve, but Rand ignores it. Now, a figure in a cloak with the color of dried blood appears, causes Rand to hurl himself away from its reach. He's shouting for the light to consume Shaitan. Now, Rand finds himself in new surroundings, a land where winter is retreating and the first touches of spring are beginning to show. He sees another mountain, oddly out of place in the setting, but with a peak broken and split, but he feels no fear and no despair at the sight of that mountain. He sees a fantastical city filled with towers in the middle of a river that flows next to the mountain, a city surrounded by high walls, gleaming white and silver structures. He believes that he's going to find safety and serenity there. The cloaked figure then reappears, though, and Rand flees towards the city. But no matter how hard he runs in the direction of the city, it goes further and further away. Pretty trippy. Now, the cloaked figure reaches out to grab him, and Rand then suddenly transports again. He finds himself on one of the bridges that's approaching into the city. Rand enters the city, stunned by the beauty of every single structure he sees. The road he's on leads directly to the center of the city where he sees a large tower that's taller than any other in the city, and it's completely white. He tells himself in his head that's where he's going to find safety, but no matter what direction he turns as he walks, the white tower comes into view. And he eventually just decides, all right, screw it, I'm going in. So he walks towards the tower, and the people of the city begin to sing a song that he couldn't understand, but it brought him the feeling of joy and salvation. Obviously, you can see where this is going. A voice whispers in his head that this is his destiny, and just as he enters the tower, a Murdral steps out and tells him that they have been waiting for him. So dream over, Rand wakes up, and with a start, he finds himself in the wine spring inn in a room with his father, Tam. Now, Tam is still weak from his injuries, but the two speak of the events of Winter's Night, the destruction of the farm, and then the flight into Emmons Field to find help for Tam, and that he eventually sought healing from Moraine. Rand tells Tam of Moraine's claims that the Trollocs were seeking Rand, Matt, and Perrin, and Tam pushes Rand for the exact words that Moraine used, and tells Rand that Aes Sedai did not lie, but the truth that an Aes Sedai tells you may not be what you think it is. To his surprise, Tam tells Rand that he should go with Moraine, and that he would be safer in Tarvalon. Rand wants to ask his father about his life outside the two rivers, but cannot bring himself to ask what his father's fevered ramblings meant. Rand instead tells his father that he must leave that night with Moraine and the others. Tam agrees and tells him to keep the Heron Mark sword. Lan comes into the room and tells Rand it's time to leave and that there is trouble. So Rand follows Lan right on out of the inn and sees a congregation of roughly three dozen torch-carrying villagers that are clustered in the yard of the inn near the burned remains of Pot on Fane's wagon. Now, Moraine faces the crowd, led by the brothers Hari and Darl Coplin, as well as Billy Conger, and a somewhat uncomfortable-looking Senbui. Now, Darl and Hari shout at Moraine to leave, blaming her for bringing the Trollocs to Emmons Field. Hari goes as far as to threaten to burn down the inn if Moraine does not leave. 
which shocks most of the villagers who are not accustomed to violence. Now Bran Alvir steps out of the inn with Harl Luhan and confronts Harry and Darl, angered that someone would threaten to burn down his inn or harm his guests. Bran blames the villagers for their lack of hospitality towards Moraine, who not only defended the town from Trollocs, but also healed many people of injuries they sustained in the attack. Now Moraine steps forward and tells the story of the legendary nation of Manetherin and its fall during the Trolloc Wars, informing the people of Emmonsfield that where they are now just peaceful farmers, this was once one of the largest and most powerful of the Ten Nations, and that their king, Aemon, and his Aes Sedai queen, Eldrin, sacrificed their lives to save the people from the armies of the Shadow that were led by Baalzaman, the Heart of the Dark, during the last days of the Trolloc Wars. Moraine's story and Bran's really pointed commentary on how much she helped the village ultimately leave the villagers very ashamed, and then they leave thankful for the Aes Sedai. Rand then resolves one day to return to Emmons Field. So that does it for the recap of Chapter 9 of Eye of the World. Now we're going to move on to Part 2, which is completely spoiler-filled. Let me throw up a new spoiler warning here. The rest of the video will carry a spoiler rating of red, with major spoilers running all the way through A Memory of Light, the final book in the series. If you have not finished all of the books, do not watch the rest of the video, you're gonna be spoiled. So let's go ahead and kick things off with some foreshadowing. During Rand's dream, there are some very heavy implications that he might be the Dragon Reborn. The fact that he sees Shael Ghul, Dragon Mount, and then Tar Valon sort of hint at this fact, and Rand recognizes them, and it harkens back to the prologue. It's also foreshadowed quite heavily that Tar Valon is inhabited by the Black Aja. The murder all at the end of the dream hint that Parvalin won't be any safer than anywhere else. And yes, this was a Shamael's plan to cause mistrust with Moraine, but nevertheless, the dream is not wrong. One of the larger pieces of foreshadowing is somewhat easy to miss, but it's there. During Moraine's story of Manetherin, she says that the armies of the Shadow rode with the banner of Baalzaman himself at their head, but then says it could not have been the Dark One. Now this is one of the clues that Baal Zaman from the dreams and at the end of the book is not the Dark One, but rather is Shamayel. Let's move on to some general thoughts from the chapter. First of all, this is one of my favorite chapters in either world. The story of Manetherin is powerful, and the way that Maureen tells it is just amazing. It sets up some major historical world building and the backstory for some of the political intrigue that will come later as well. Rand's dream sequence poses a couple questions also. It's interesting that the only time Tarvalon shows up in the first book of The Wheel of Time is during this dream sequence, and the only time Rand visits Tarvalon in the story until he comes to see Egwene in Towers of Midnight. The dream is most likely part of a dream shard that Ashamael is controlling. This appears to be how he does his things with the dreams that Rand has, he pulls the boys into these shards where he completely controls the world. This is a concept that won't be fully fleshed out until the books much, much later, but it is consistent that Moradin makes use of them later on in the books, and that we know he is a dreamer, just like Egwene, although far more powerful and far more experienced. So there are a couple things here that leave some open-ended questions. First of all, if Ashamael can find Rand's dreams, pull him into a dream shard, and do the same to Perrin and Matt, why in the world did he send Trollocs and a Fade to the Two Rivers? Why not just kill the boys and be done with it? That should not have even ever been an issue based on what we've seen him do. And also, if the Dark One did not want them dead, then just go get them yourself and travel back. Moraine would not have been able to stop you or send Slayer. You have access to him. He can kidnap him and be back almost instantaneously. The easy answer to this question is, is that the story needs to happen, but still, it's a question from the chapter. Another question is during Maureen's story of Manetherin, she tells of Eldraine pulling so much of the One Power and destroying an entire army and burning a city away. Now this level of power isn't seen anywhere in the series, even with the Sa'angriol, other than maybe Rand. This is simply just too much of the One Power for someone like her to be able to wield alone. She must have had a very powerful Sa'angriol without a buffer, as she did die, or more likely the story just was passed down and the actual events were much less spectacular. Either way, it is an unanswered question from the chapter. So that's it for chapter 9 from Eye of the World titled Tellings of the Wheel. What did you all think of the chapter? Let me know in the comments of the video. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. Make sure to check out the rest of the videos in this series by clicking on the playlist. You should be able to binge them all. 
Special thank you to my patrons. You can see them up on the screen right now. You make all of this possible, specifically this series, which is never going to get a lot of views, but those of you that love it, love it. You can also, again, check out that playlist and these other videos here. Thank you for watching, and until next time, peace out.